Yep. And I'm recording as well. So uh, Chair, we're ready to begin when you're ready. Okay, great. Can you hear me okay, Rachel? Yes. All right. Thank you, everybody. We will call to order the Thursday, May 7th meeting of the Community Transit Board of Directors. This is a remote meeting, as is obvious to everybody who's on it. Um, if you would uh, just give me a moment to go through a few housekeeping items uh, that might help the meeting <clears throat> run uh, more efficiently and, and uh, give everybody the opportunity to be heard. Um, today's meeting will be auto re audio recorded. And with these kind of meetings that we've all, I think, been on increasingly, uh, there's, this is probably not news to anybody, but just so we can uh, have it out there to reduce background noise, if you could please keep your phone and computer on mute unless you are uh, speaking. The slides referenced in today's financial update can be found on our website next to the meeting agenda. Board members, a couple of notes on Zoom. There is a chat feature to request uh, technical assistance. You can also use the raise your hand feature for questions or comments. Um, so if you, or you can just type in the chat that you would like to be recognized to speak. I can see some of you up here, but there's only limited uh, space on the screen. So I don't know that I can see all of you. So raising your hand might not always work. So if you could just type into the chat that you have something to say or uh, something of that nature, then I will recognize you. And thanks all for your flexibility on this. And thank you to all in the audience who have joined us. We appreciate that. And it's good to see everybody. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rachel for our roll call. Council member Kim Daughtry. Here. Mayor Leonard Kelly. Home. Council member Tom Merrill. Here. Thank you. Mayor John Nearing. Here. Labor Representative Lance Norton. Lance, are you on the call? Okay. Uh, Council Member Jan Schwetty. Here. Mayor Nicola Smith. Here. Council Member Mike Todd. Here. Uh, Council Member Stephanie Wright is expected to join later. I'm also going to take roll call for the alternates. So, Council Member Mike Gallagher. Here. Council Member Laura Johnson. Present. Council Member Joe Marine. Council Member uh, James McNeil. Council Member Jared. Mead. Okay, I'm also going to take roll call for staff and presenters so we can ensure they're on the line. I'll start with Emmett Heath. Here. Jerry Beardsley. I know she's here. Jerry, are you online? Okay, moving along. I'm here. Okay, great. Thank you. Al Hendricks. Here. Cesar Portillo. Roland Behe. Here. Thank you. And Sarah Burnett. Here. And I also see that Councilmember Mike Todd is here, correct? Yes, I'm here. Okay, perfect. You hear me? Just, Thanks. Thank you. And I just wanted to confirm, Labor Representative Lance Norton, are you, have you joined us? Okay, thank you. Chair, we do have a quorum of board members. Thank you. And I see on the notes, Council Member Nate Nearing, uh, didn't hear his name called, but he is oh. on as well. Oh, apologies for that. <laughs> no problem. He's on as well. So um, I think we have everybody here but Lance. And then council member Wright will uh, call in in a bit. Correct. So now is the time we set aside for public comment. And we do have one uh, that I'm aware of, one written public comment that I believe Rachel will read into the record. Yes. And then uh, after that, we will, uh, do we have the ability, Rachel, uh, I can't remember if we did this last time, did we open it up for anything on the line or is it just written public comment only? 
We did request written comment in advance of the meeting. Okay, great. You can go ahead then and read that into the record. Okay. Dear Community Transit Board, first, I, Joe Kunzler, want to stress to the Community Transit Board in the most uplifting terms that these telemeetings are the present and should be our future. I'm sure the board members find the commute trip reduction literally convenient for you and also pro-climate. Furthermore, telemeetings with citizens' public comment readout ensures more diverse citizen perspectives are included via online meetings. So I, Joe, sim deeply appreciate this new normal. I, Joe Kunzler, argue that community transit must be a transit for the community, not a transit corporation branding itself community transit. As the Australian politician Paul Keating would say, all leaders of any substance have been leaders capable of telling a story. You cannot do this by reverting to holding barely accessible board meetings at 3 p.m. far from a swift line, and you cannot do this hoping the city government of Everett will just give away Everett Transit. Your future is dependent on connecting with your riders politically, physically, and fiscally. With Everett Transit in dire fiscal straits, a merger is key to retain and improve regional connections. We hardcore political actors and actresses know for public transit, public trust will take time to rebuild, reconstruct, and retain. Therefore, public transit must confidently be a truly community-governed public trust, providing a safe and daily sanitized, low-emission means to connect citizens to our community. Just as during this pandemic crisis, public transit is connecting health workers and other frontline workers to their job sites, as well as food banks, grocers, and other essential destinations vital to promoting strong public health. I, Joe Kunzler, will conclude starting with this Paul Keating quotation. I think leadership's always been about two main things, imagination and courage. I, Joe Kunzler, ask community transit to please stay on this path to retain the courage to be more transparent and the imagination for a more connected and transparent future to help ease a merger with Everett Transit. This pandemic requires new glasses and new framing to see new politics clearly. Time we accepted these glasses, then make the 2020s a transformational Think Transit First public trust building decade. Chair, that concludes the public comment. Thank you for that, Rachel, and thank you, Mr. Kunzler. Um, I will move on then to the information items, and that starts with our CEO, uh, Heath, with the COVID-19 response. Thank you, Chair Neering. We have two information presentations um, prepared for you today. I'll provide a more general overview of our COVID activities, and then our Director of Administration, Jerry Beardsley, has been leading our financial uh, scenario planning work, and she'll give you a more in-depth update on our financial planning. Let me uh, start with, oh, by the way, most of you are pretty familiar with uh, most of the activities that are ongoing in various agencies and jurisdictions, so I don't plan to go into detail, but when I'm, when I'm done, uh, certainly if you have questions or, or would like more detail on a subject, um, please feel free to ask. Our ridership has been fairly stable, uh, albeit it is uh, down on average 70%. Our commuter, commuter service to uh, southern destinations is down about 95%. Our local ridership is down about 60%. We have maintained fairly healthy level of ridership on our swift lines. Since the pandemic began, uh, our own ridership ha is down about 1.1 million boarding. The Sound Transit contracted service that we operate is down about 500,000 boarding. Uh, to give you some context, we very nearly uh, achieved 12 million boarding in 2019. Uh, currently, we're operating a fixed route service level at about 65% of normal. We have plenty of staff available and have been doing a good job delivering that service. 
Uh, we have operated between 99% and 100% of our uh, daily service on a regular basis, very consistently for the past several weeks. Our van full fleet's operating at about 53% of normal with 209 vans out of uh, van full groups out of service uh, from a beginning level of about 400 at the beginning of March. I reported last month that we suspended fares in order to allow us to keep the front door closed on our coaches so we could isolate our coach operators from close contact. We're continuing with that fare suspension um, at least through the end of May and very likely longer. Um, so far uh, in our workforce, about one third of the workforce has taken advantage of paid leave for uh, COVID related reasons. Uh, interestingly, about two thirds of our entire workforce has been reporting e to work either at our operating facilities or in the field on a regular basis. And the other third, almost 100% have been working remotely um, most of the time. Um, I say almost 100%, there are a handful of employees who's, who's um, Duties are essential and can be, form, be performed better on site. Uh, and so we do have several um, staff, staff employees, administrative employees who have been regularly reporting to our work site. Been a lot of conversation throughout this event about personal protective equipment. <clears throat> We've had a lot of success recently uh, resupplying our PPE. In most cases, uh, well, in all cases we have somewhere between about one years and one year and two years worth of supply on hand for the normal PP, uh, PPE items, including sanitizer, um, N95 masks, gloves, disinfectants, um, and wipes. Uh, plan to continue to source those products and stay um, way ahead in terms of having enough inventory on hand to ensure that regardless of how the virus might cycle in the future, we would have enough PPE to keep everybody supplied. We, um, I, I have a long list of policy uh, changes that we have made since the beginning of this event. Um, examples would include daily disinfecting, fare suspension, su supplemental leave PPE, limiting passenger loads, uh, et cetera. If you have any questions <clears throat> about what uh, changes we've made to our operations, uh, feel free to, to ask me about those at the end of this report. We've continued to stay in close communication with all of our stakeholders. Um, we meet on a regular basis with our partner agencies in the district. Uh, our labor relations staff is maintaining uh, regular contact with our labor unions. That was daily for quite a while during this event, and I believe lately we've dropped back to um, every other day. We're communicating with our employees on a regular basis through regular written communications, uh, more recently through video communications. We started a program inviting employees to submit their questions and we respond to those in a video Q&A format now uh, on, a, on a weekly basis additionally. Likewise, all of our social media channels uh, are full with communications both to our employees, to our customers, and to our uh, partner jurisdictions. COVID uh, case statistics for our agency. About five weeks ago at your April meeting, we had, um, we had had 11, uh, employees test positive for uh, COVID-19. Five weeks later, we have, we have had no more infections in our workforce. What, uh, what that tells me, one, we've been extremely successful flattening the curve. It also tells me that the virus was um, present among us in, in uh, February. That's when a lot of our workforce was becoming infected before um, before any emergency proclamations, before any real realization that the uh, virus could be communicated by people who were asymptomatic. So in the first three weeks, we had 11 positive tests, and in the last five weeks, we've had zero. Um, I, I'm hopeful that that is 
entirely the result of our efforts to mitigate the virus through uh, all the, the policies and procedures and practices that are recommended by the CDC and the health district. Um, future planning. Um, we continue to meet as an executive team three times a week. There's still a large number of tactical issues to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, that said, we're also continuing to shift our focus to longer range planning. Uh, the major long-range issues we're working on include the restoration of fares. Again, likely not to happen, uh, would not happen before June 1st and quite likely later than that. We continue to deal with issues related to non-destination riders. That's an issue primarily in our SWIFT corridors. Roland Behe and his staff are working on uh, service plans for the future. We uh, we're, when we reduced our service to the current 65% level, that was more of a triage initiative to uh, reduce the service level to match the availability of coach operators. And it was like, it was the, it was like using a, a meat cleaver as opposed to a scalpel. Uh, Roland and his folks are now in the scalpel mode of developing a service plan that we, that will better serve our customers, uh, a much uh, a much more, um, uh, a plan that will serve our customers much better and, and one that hopefully will have good staying power through the rest of this year. I um, want to comment on uh, capital projects, especially uh, sound transits projects at uh, Northgate, uh, Northgate Link Station and the Linwood Link Extension to Linwood. We're in regular conversation with the executives of Sound Transit. They uh, continue to be very confident that they will hold the schedules for Northgate Link opening in 2021 and also the Linwood Link extension in 2024. We have a lot of parallel activities to uh, synchronize our service with the opening of their capital project. Uh, so we are continuing with all of our efforts to prepare to serve uh, link at Northgate and also prepare to serve link at the Linwood City Center Station. And I mentioned uh, off the top that one of our um, most significant activities right now is financial planning for the future. Jerry Beardsley is here. I'm going to turn this over to Jerry and ask her to update you on our forecast for financial status. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? Thank you. So, um, thank you, Emmett. This is Jerry. Um, I can hear myself in an echo. I'm trying to fix that. Hold on just a minute. Okay, so um, good afternoon. Uh, today, what I really wanted to do is give you an update on um, what uh, scenarios we're modeling and how we're looking at both our revenue and expenditure outlook as it changes. I'm guessing that many of you in your communities have um, heard similar presentations from your uh, communities. Probably what you've heard the most is how many unknowns there are. Um, we, we all rely heavily on sales tax revenue and that's uh, probably the biggest area where we're gonna see some uh, uncertainty for some months now. Um, everything you see today will be a snapshot in time. It's a work in progress, uh, definitely subject to change. Rachel, do you want to go to the next slide, please? Rachel? There we go. So um, pretty early on, January and February, we started to ramp up some efforts related to the pandemic. We are always looking at uh, our updated sales tax and fares revenue and assumptions. Um, they became the primary focus. In any recession, the sales tax revenue is going to decrease, and that's really the key area where we get most of our revenue, 72% of our revenue. Uh, so we started pretty quickly updating our assumption, assumptions and our models. With, with expenses, um, what we we're almost immediately able to do is to start tracking our COVID relating, related uh, expenses, things like additional cleaning, uh, premium pay, supplemental leave, some additional costs for PPE. 
we started to also look at applying additional filter to decisions so that we could understand uh, as we move forward how those decisions might impact both short term and long term. Some examples of some things that we did are uh, to look at service expansion. So the first uh, option in most playbooks for us for a recession are to look at deferring or delaying uh, uh, an increase in, in our service. In our case, we had a planned service increase for September of this year. We delayed that indefinitely, and you'll see that in some later slides. We also uh, instituted a hiring fee freeze, selective hiring freeze, and also a, a travel freeze right away. So we're continuing to look at those uh, options. And then we began coordinating very quickly with um, our, our peers, other transits across the country, regionally and in the state. Um, we have, for example, a group of CFOs, chief financial officers that Mary Albert, our budget manager, and I participate with. Emmett is on regular calls with uh, leaders at other transit agencies, uh, DOT, and others. Uh, it really goes through every level of our agency. So there's a fair group, for example, that meets. And I think that just one last thing on this slide is that the advocacy, we were uh, able to work very quickly with our region and our uh, APTA, the National uh, Advocacy Organization for Transits. And I think that had a great deal to do with the success uh, with our CARES Act funding, which I'll touch on later. Next slide, please, Rachel. So I'm gonna start with just 2020 and then I'll move on to later years. Um, just for some context, we have come up with two scenarios. We will continue to evolve. They seem to be consistent with what other transit agencies are assuming uh, in our region, both to the north and south of us. Uh, in our case, rapid recovery and a slower recovery. What we're showing here are our projections so far in those two scenarios for um, the 2020 sales tax and revenue from fares as well. And we're comparing it to the 2019 actuals. So in the case of sales tax, what we're looking at right now for the year is a decrease of 25 to 40 million just in the sales tax revenue. It's about 16 to 26% of our projected revenue, our budgeted revenue uh, and our actuals from last year. For fares, we stopped collecting fares uh, pretty quickly, and that will we're expecting that to ramp back up, but, but for now, for the year, we're projecting 11 million to 14 million as the range. So about a, it's a roughly about a 50% decrease in our sales tax revenue. So those are the main, uh, kind of the biggest areas of our revenue. Again, sales tax being 72% of our revenue, fares are 11% of our revenue. The expenditures that I've listed below the 3.1 million, those are additional expenditures that we did not budget. Uh, they include 2020 projections of cost for things like cleaning, premium pay, um, supplemental leave, those types of costs. The other thing I'll say on, on this part is just, um, like you, we receive our revenue from sales tax two months after the spending occurs. So in this case, in May, we will be receiving revenue from March spending. In June, we will receive revenue from April spending. We expect that the spending from March and April will be some of the most impacted by the COVID pandemic. And what that means is it will take until June, maybe July or August to really get a good understanding of the impacts on our sales tax revenue. In addition to the normal two month lag, Department of Revenue has also granted a deferral so that uh, agencies have until, or, or businesses have uh, until end of June to be submitting sales tax revenue that they would typically have su submitted earlier. Uh, my guess is that your jurisdictions are facing a similar situation. It really has to do with the uncertainties and when we'll get more accurate information. Next slide, please, Rachel. So now what we're doing is we're taking a look at sales tax projections and we're going out uh, a couple of years so that you can see the actual uh, revenue, which was 151 million in 2019. And then you see in the colored lines, there's a, 
I've had, I need to remind myself, there are a number of people who don't have access to this PowerPoint. Um, they may be calling in. It is available on our um, website next to the agenda for this meeting. What you see is that with those projections I showed on the previous page, our uh, projected revenue for sales tax in 2020 was 154 million. In the yellow and the red, what you see are the rapid and slow recovery options. You'll see that over 2021 and 22, we, we predict in both cases that the revenue returns slowly starting to climb back up. Some of the differences have to do with assumptions about whether we see one recurrence of the virus or we see multiple recurrences of the virus. Um, and again, the further out you go, the more uncertainty. So these projections will change, um, but it shows you some indication of how we think revenue will re return. We also were able to compare to the great pandemic and to look at how sales tax was affected. While there are some similarities, there are also some differences. So uh, in our case, we'll use that to help guide our, our projections. Next slide, please. What you have here is a similar approach. Now we're showing uh, fair revenue. We're currently working on uh, assumptions for our transit development plan, our six year plan. And what we see here, as I described on an earlier page, an assumption of about a 50% decline in our fair revenue. So what that means is if you look at the 2020 on the left of the slide is that while we would have received about 24 million in fair revenue, we're projecting a range of 10 to 12 million. We again see that that will increase uh, over the next couple of years. And, and as we get more information about consumer behavior, what our customers are doing, how many are returning to work and when, that will further inform these assumptions and these scenarios. Next slide, please, Rachel. Just a little bit about the CARES Act relief. If you recall, this was included, I think, in the third federal stimulus package. We are uh, extremely grateful for federal relief that's coming to public transit agencies. Uh, we are, I just wanna make sure you understand how sensitive we are to the fact that the county and the cities in our area do not have the benefit of the same relief yet. Maybe it will come. Um, but we're very sensitive to the fact that your agencies are not getting that uh, one-time relief that will help whether kind of this initial part of the uh, re, uh, impacts of pandemic. The one-time revenue is 39 million. It's distributed uh, to us. The money goes into a, basically to a checking account, which we can then draw down on. The eligible expenses do not include loss of revenue but we are able to uh, charge things like our ongoing operating costs, which is an expansion of what most federal funds are able to apply to. And the way we look at that really is that we are able to use that then to offset higher expenses and loss of revenue, even not, not a direct correlation. And you'll see on the next slide, what we think is that it makes us close to, not necessarily whole in 2020, when you look at all of our costs, uh, which is great. It gives us some time to be looking at uh, more specifics in terms of the impacts, but you'll see in the next slide some real substantial need in our years. Next slide, please, Rachel. Okay, so I broke all the rules on PowerPoint presentations. <laughs> this is a lot of numbers uh, and information on this slide. I'm gonna take a little bit of time to walk you through it. What we're showing here is a longer term look. So 2020 out to 2024. And again, this is to show you the baseline where we're, we're changing mostly the revenue, and not the uh, expenditures. And that gives us some flexibility to adjust the modeling with different inputs so that we can play around with different scenarios. So if you will look at the 2020 column, the top third of the uh, document, what you'll see is a summary of how the map works for us for 2020 using our board adopted budget. We start with starting cash. We add our assumptions for revenue for the year. We come up with our total operating expense. We pull off transfers for capital. 
come up with our end and cash balance. I should say that there are uh, funds that go into reserves, uh, workers' comp, that type of thing, included in these line items. We uh, keep two, roughly two months of our operating um, reserve as a target based on the Moss Adams recommendation from some years ago. When you go through that whole equation, we had projected when we adopted the budget, we would end the year with an unreserved cash balance of about 47 million. Uh, equate that to having a little bit of money at the end of each year between your, your income and your expenditures. It provides a buffer for us in the case of an economic downturn. It's one of the things we are very careful about every year and as we look out to the six year planning. You can see that the unreserved cash increases as you move over to the right to 2024. Again, projecting to the out years, a little more uncertain. Um, all of this assumes we fully funded our our reserves and our planned expenditures. One last thing I can tell you about the top third of this is that the budget and the TDP that are adopted by the board are prepared early in a year, come to you middle to fall of the year and are then adopted. So we already have updates to this information. And in future presentations, you may see, for example, a revised version even of this because we wanna reflect the act actuals um, as we're continuing to talk to you. I'm going to pause here and now go down to the two scenarios. I've eliminated all the math, but I wanted you to see a couple of assumptions and how that changes the bottom line for us. So if you look at the assumptions on the right in the middle of the page, you can see that we have done a number of things. We've made assumptions about the sales tax decrease consistent with one of the slides earlier. We're assuming that we're able to draw down the CARES Act funding, 39 million, all of it in 2020. That's a plan that most transits are working towards. Again, we have an expanded set of expenses that we can charge against that. We're assuming that the 3.1 million in additional COVID expenses um, are spent. We have made only one other adjustment to expenditures in these scenarios, and that is that early on, we decided not to move forward with September service increase. So for purposes of this page and this modeling, we made that decision for both 20 and 21. We've not made any other changes to expenditures. That's the next piece of work that will come back to you. So if you look at scenario one, the rapid recovery, you can see that that CARES Act funding really, really helps us uh, weather the 2020 uh, decline in sales tax revenue. Without it, we would be in a much different position. We see a decrease in our ending fund balance in out years, but remember that part of our job is to come to you with adjustments to those expenditures so that we can end with a, a, a prudent, carefully planned reserve at the end of the, each year. In scenario two, which is the slow recovery, you start to see some numbers go into the red. And again, it's our job to make sure that this doesn't happen. We will be coming to you with options and scenarios that will show adjustments to expenditure. But really what this shows is every year as you have less unreserved cash at the year end, that's less to carry forward to the next year. It will eventually impact some pretty large decisions that you as a board will help us make uh, in our uh, proposed TDP, Transit Development Plan. So a lot of information. Uh, I'm about to go to the next slide. I only have a couple more. Why don't I finish this? And then if you wanna go back to this with any questions, we're happy to do that. Next slide, please, Rachel. I've talked a lot about unknowns all the way through the sales tax revenue impacts, depth and duration of a recession what happens with COVID-19? Does it come back? Does it come back once? Does it come back more than once? What's our new normal for our customers, for our agency, for government and business? And really, what are those strategies that we're going to put forward for adjusting our expenditures? Um, we will be doing these reports regularly for you uh, and the Finance Committee, and we'll keep coming back with um, adjustments as we get more information. Next slide, please, Rachel. This is the last slide. Really wanted to talk just a little bit about next steps, continued modeling, adjusting our assumptions. We'll be working on 
uh, not only adjustments to the current year expenditures, but also our proposed 2021 budget and our six year TDP. Both of those will come to you later this year. We'll be doing regular updates for finance and board, finance committee and the board. Uh, continue to coordinate with other agencies uh, and um, our federal delegation and state delegation. We would expect that um, you know, when we come to you next month at the board meeting, we will receive the first indications of what our April sales tax revenue will be. With that in mind, remember that it may not be until July that we get the full details. So you'll expect to see in the next few months more specifics um, and, and more options really on both sides of the equation. And with that, I'm going to stop. That's the presentation for today and offer to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, uh, Director Beardsley. Any questions from, uh, from the board? And again, I'm looking at, but if you could just type in the chat bar if you do have anything, in case I don't see your hand. Um, I had one. Uh, so our, our, our fuel expense, um, with the, the, you know, a little bit of a dip in fuel prices, how, how impactful is that or is it not much at all? We'll continue to look at the fuel expense. We did not adjust it in the version that we showed you today, but in the next version, we'll be able to recall okay. that we have a $5 million fuel reserve uh, every year in the case that the fuel costs go up we would assume that we're not touching that. The real question would be is whether we're adjusting our operating budget to right. reduce costs for fuel. Yeah, perfect, okay. Very good report. Um, and I think like all of us at the city level, we're eagerly awaiting some of those first real sales tax reports that'll give us a better picture. So thank you. You're welcome. And then uh, next we go to presentations um, and we have our uh, legislative lobbyist, Board Jurassic, and I believe Divorce on the phone, am I right? Or on, yeah, there he is. Go uh, ahead, Yours is, you've got the floor, my friend. All right, well, thank you very much. I apologize for the poor uh, visual, it's a little hazy, but uh, it's good to see all of you. And uh, this, is, this is kind of a historic moment for me. This is the first time I'm not wearing a suit and tie in front of you guys, and it uh, feels pretty darn good. <laughs> but anyways, um, what I wanted to do today is just go over uh, the legislative session that adjourned uh, March 12th. Feels like it was quite a while uh, longer than two months, but uh, we did uh, wrap up the special session. Uh, started January 3rd, 13th and uh, did end on time on uh, March 12th. Uh, the main focus of uh, the short sessions, the 60 day se sessions are uh, policy bills and then doing the supplemental budgets. Uh, there was one uh, twist for us this supplemental uh, uh, or this uh, short session, uh, the 2020 session, and that was in regard to uh, the initiative 976 passing and uh, um, taking uh, billions of dollars out of uh, transportation revenue for both uh, state and local entities. So that, that was kind of the main transportation focus for the legislature and the governor uh, this last session. And um, the, the agencies, the transportation agencies that were, were hit uh, the hardest was the State Patrol, the Department of Licensing, Department of Transportation, and, and the ferries uh, underneath WashDOT. And the way uh, the legislature and the governor's office uh, handled the shortfall is that they basically transferred funds. They, they did a patch job. They uh, transferred funds from different uh, agencies and accounts into those uh, agencies, the State Patrol, DO, Department of Licensing, Ferries, and, and DOT, and then also uh, deferred uh, purchases and pro projects. So um, they did everything to, uh, to keep the ship from going on the rocks uh, for the interim, and then are looking at the 2021 session for a new revenue package and, uh, and to uh, and also to await the, uh, the outcome of the, uh, the lawsuit that's still going on. Um, for local jurisdictions, uh, they were hit hard uh, regarding uh, transportation benefit districts. 
legislature did hear several bills, but uh, did not take any steps to implement any new laws or taxes, and they're awaiting the lawsuit. Uh, same with Sound Transit. So uh, the only real actions that were taken were to shore up the uh, state agencies. For community transit, our, uh, our primary focus was not to get, not to have any of our funding, our grant funding cut that we received in the 2019 uh, legislative session. Uh, at the bottom of the first page, you can see that we, uh, in 2019-21, uh, we went in and asked for uh, $10 million through the regional mobility grants. And as you recall, we, uh, that was for our green line and we were the number one rated project. Uh, thankfully, the, uh, the first $5 million uh, was not cut or deferred. And uh, the second $5 million is, uh, is still on track for next biennium. Uh, but everything's up in the air for next biennium. Um, but the good news is our first five was not cut. Uh, another uh, $10 million that we received in connecting Washington funds back in 2015 is scheduled to be parceled out to us over the next four bienniums starting in 2021. Uh, that's for the Orange Line and the Everett to Smoky Point Line. Uh, we did retain those funds to date and uh, they were not pushed out into the future. Um, one, uh, one interesting aspect that we, we did get caught up in um, and hopefully will be resolved here was uh, van pool replacements. Um, part of the governor's deferral list or WashDOT's referral list was to defer all, all new uh, purchases and uh, replacement of van pool vans. Um, in the end, the, all of those vans that uh, uh, are supposed to be funded um, were not cut, but we're still awaiting funding. So there, there was language in the budget that was prevalent throughout the budget that basically said, uh, in this case, your van pool vans will be funded. Uh, however, these purchases are subject to pending reduction decisions by the Washington State Department of Transportation. So they didn't come out and cut, cut the vans, and they said it's up to the discretion of WashDOT to see where they are financially. Um, what we have at this point, we have not received any funds and we have not been told we are not getting any funds. So we're in a holding pattern there. Um, so, and that's, uh, I think that's about a million, million two total that we would be expecting. So those are the fiscal issues uh, that we were focused in on this session. Um, policy bills, there were lots and lots of policy bills this session. Um, some new ones in transportation, some old ones in transportation. The, uh, the only policy bill that touches our world that, that passed was what's called the block the box legislation. This was the third year that this was introduced and um, it, um, House Bill 1793 basically set up a pilot program solely for Seattle, specifically for downtown Seattle, to use automatic, automated traffic safety cameras. Uh, this does affect community transit uh, when we're downtown, and uh, this is a, a three-year project, and you can see uh, all the, the caveats that are going uh, into this project. It is something uh, the City of Seattle has worked on for quite a while. They have a, a major problem with people stopping in the intersection and then uh, uh, stymieing the flow of traffic, which affects our, our bus routes also. So we'll keep a close watch on that and see how that occurs. There was a lot of angst uh, with uh, citizens and special interest groups about uh, having automatic automated safety cameras downtown Seattle, but in the end, uh, they were able to acquiesce and uh, put together a pilot program. So that is the only piece of legislation that I'm gonna be talking about that actually passed. Um, every, the next bill, House Bill 2929, every year there's legislation introduced, sometimes multiple pieces of legislation that um, look at changing the composition of transportation boards, whether they're PTBAs like community transit or sound transit, 
uh, we've seen a variety of those. This year, a bill was introduced but was not heard that would have uh, affected metro, PTBAs, and county transportation authorities, and it would have had a fully voting uh, union member on the board. Um, so that was a new one for this year. Don't know if we'll see that again next year or not, but uh, did not get a hearing this year. A couple of new, new items were um, bills that were introduced that wanted to reprioritize the six transportation or WashDOT uh, policy goals. And they have six goals um, that they look at and prioritize projects with. Uh, with all the talk of a new revenue package uh, next legislative session, a lot of folks uh, looked at, well, you know, should we reprioritize these? Are there other issues that we should be looking at? I've listed three bills here, just the House versions, but they were Senate versions also. None of these bills passed, but we will see these bills again next year. Um, the first one, 2285, elevating road maintenance and preservation and transportation planning. Uh, a lot of folks thought, you know, with the, the, uh, the, our, uh, our roads and bridges getting uh, long in the tooth and needing a lot of repair, that we need to focus in on that. So they were looking at uh, elevating maintenance and preservation as one of the uh, transportation policy goals. Another new one, 2461, on the bottom of page three, uh, related to uh, including healthcare and transportation policy goals. Um, probably see that one definitely again next year. And then there was kind of an all expanding uh, transportation policy goal bill at the top of page uh, four, 2688. And I won't get into all those requirements, but it was a multi subject uh, regarding transportation policy goals. Um, two new interim studies. Um, and what's interesting about both of these studies. They're actually being taken on by the Washington Traffic Safety Commission. Usually our studies that ro uh, relate to transportation and transit specifically go through the Joint Transportation Committee, uh, but these are going through the Washington Traffic Safety Commission. And the first one deals with automated enforcement technology for a high oc occupancy vehicle lane passenger compliance demonstration project. That's a long way of saying uh, Kitsap Transit is paying for a demonstration project to use automated uh, enforcement technology in the HOV lanes. Um, so that's kind of interesting that they are footing the entire bill. The legislature is not um, uh, paying into that, but uh, the Washington Traffic Safety Commission will be overseeing it. And then just as part of a block the box legislation, the pilot program, uh, overseeing that will be the Washington Traffic Safety Commission. And uh, you can see a little language there of, uh, of what they will be doing. Um, if any of you are interested in the full language on any of these bills or any of these interim studies, I can provide you those. Um, just a reminder, there, there's still two transportation studies going on. I don't have them listed. They were here last session in 2019 and they are continuing with the Joint Transportation Committee. And one deals with the uh, electrification of the state's fleet. That's in year two of a, a two-year study. And then a future transportation funding needs. So both of those were, were lined up last year in anticipation of bringing forward recommendations at the end of this year in anticipation of a new transportation revenue package. So I'll stop there um, and see if there's any questions. Thank you, DeVore. Any questions uh, from the board? All right, we appreciate that update from you. And I do have just two, two quick things, if you like. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, just locally on the legislative front, uh, everyone knows that Senator John McCoy is uh, retiring. Uh, or a step down from his seat after many, many years. Um, next week on the 13th is when the, uh, the county looks at um, who will be replacing them, him. I know uh, June Robinson is probably the front runner at this point. Um, 
but uh, I don't vote, so I'll just speculate. And um, uh, two of our uh, current senators, Senator Marco Leas and Senator Steve Hobbs, are both running for lieutenant governor uh, in this election, uh, both from Snohomish County, as you know, both in the middle of their terms. Um, so that will be an interesting one. There's, I think, a total of five uh, candidates for that race, three Democrats and two Republicans. And uh, just a last topic to touch on briefly uh, regarding a special session. Uh, the quarterly state revenue forecast is scheduled for June 17th. I understand uh, it's probably going to be moved up to June 2nd, and that is uh, due in part to uh, something Jerry was just talking about, the, uh, the lack of revenue that is being generated by the state. They want to stay on top of their revenue forecasts. Uh, moving up the revenue forecast indicates to me that they're seriously thinking about having a special session. Uh, there's been a lot of talk. I know uh, none of the legislators that I have talked to to date want to have a special session, uh, but they may need to. Um, so if there is a special session, it'll be, um, I, I imagine it'll be focused on the operating budget and not the transportation budget and definitely not uh, uh, discussions of new revenue for transportation during a special session. That'll be saved for the, uh, the 2021 session. But that's all I have for you. Excellent, thank you. Okay, um, that brings us to committee reports. Um, and I'll start with the executive committee. Uh, the executive committee did meet on Thursday, April the 16th, virtually. And CEO Heath provided uh, a status update on the agency's response plans to COVID-19 and his CEO report. The next executive committee is scheduled for Thursday, the 21st of May at 11.30 a.m. And next would be Finance, Performance, and Oversight, Council Member Todd. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Give me a thumbs up. Thank you. Uh, so the Finance Performance and Oversight Committee met on Thursday, April 16th, 2020. Council members Nate Nearing, Tom Merrill, Jan Schwede, and I attended via phone. Uh, we conducted our normal business and review of vouchers, and we, you will see that today on consent agenda. Uh, we're recommending approval of items C through J with respect to the voucher and the payroll. Uh, there are no items on the action agenda for us today. And our standard reports are in your packet. Uh, this is the last, what next to the last good sales tax report. The March sales tax report uh, reflects purchases made in January 2020, and in March, we therefore collected approximately $11.7 million in sales tax revenue, which was $1 million more than budgeted. This is a growth rate of 11% as compared to last year, 29, March 2019 number. And next month, we'll have one more anachronistic sales tax report, and after that, uh, Jerry's forecast will prevail. Um, number two is our fuel diesel fuel report. As was, as was mentioned earlier, uh, fuel prices are down. We paid an average of 1.70 per gallon for diesel fuel compared to the 2020 budget amount of 225. So this is a positive variance of 55 cents a gallon. And as you noted earlier, we're probably using less fuel. So we're doing well in the fuel budget category. Uh, third item was a special report. Uh, we already had it today that Jerry presented to us an update on the potential financial impacts, and that was what we received earlier. Excellent report, we appreciate that. The next Finance Performance and Oversight Committee meeting is scheduled for 2 p.m. on Thursday, May 21st. That's the end of my report. Thank you, Council Member Todd. And next is Strategic Alignment and Capital Development with Mayor Kelly. Hi, thank you, John. Uh, the meeting was attended by uh, myself, uh, Labor Representative Lance Norton, Mayor Smith, Council Member Todd, and County Council Member Stephanie Wright. Uh, one item was forwarded to today's consent calendar. It's RFQ number 217-079. It's a task order for Merrill Creek Administration Building uh, Facilities Master Plan Phase 2 Design. Uh, this item awards OTAC Inc. 100% design of the Merrill Creek Administration Building, the task order for $1,470,000 and change is determined fair and reasonable. Uh, this amount is lower than the independent governmental uh, cost estimate of $2,300,000 and change 
Due to the scope adjustment and better agreed upon costs, the Strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee recommends board approval. Uh, there are no action items today uh, from the committee and some informational items and other business as the committee was briefed on modifications to service practices and a reduction in trips in response to the COVID pandemic. Staff also reported on a 30-day extension of the Link Connections Northgate Public Outreach. A public hearing will be scheduled for the June meeting, followed by a request for approval at the Board of Directors meeting on July 2nd. Our next scheduled meeting of the Strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee is Wednesday, May 20th at 2 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Kelly. And that is the end of our committee reports. That brings us to the consent calendar. Does anybody wish to pull any items off consent for further discussion? If not, we'll entertain a motion for the entire uh, consent agenda approval. I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Moved by Councilmember Daughtry, seconded by Mayor Kelly to approve consent agenda. Any final discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We do have one action item today, and uh, Sarah Burnett, I'm going to ask you to brief us on that. And this is the memorandum of understanding for a one year contract extension with. Uh, with our Association of Machinists. Go ahead, Sarah, thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, there is the one item under item A of action items. It is uh, a one year contract extension between Community Transit and IAM District Lodge 160. Uh, IAM District Lodge 160 actually represents two different bargaining units at Community Transit. And this contract extension uh, is in regards to the bargaining unit containing our transportation supervisors and instructor employees. Their labor agreement expired um, at the end of April, just recently. And prior to the expiration of their contract, as the parties were preparing for bargaining, we realized with all of the COVID-19 response activities that were going on, that traditional bargaining would be very, very difficult. So the parties have mutually agreed on a one-year contract extension, which includes a 3% wage, incre wage increase, plus the continuation of all other contract terms. There is a memo in your board packet which details this extension, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about the contract extension, but I understand if discussion is needed, that would need to occur within an executive session. Yes, yeah, so this is a pretty straightforward rollover. Um, any questions? I move that we authorize Emic to sign the contract extension. Thank you, Mayor Kelly. Councilmember Todd seconds. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to approve this contract extension. Any final comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Uh, any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, on to the chair's report. Uh, so the American Public Transportation Association recently canceled their uh, transit board members and board administrator seminar, which was scheduled for August in Salt Lake City. And I know there were some interested in going to that. So we wanted to let you know the annual um, conference and expo that would, is scheduled for October uh, is still on, on schedule. You know, I guess we'll wait and see if that remains the case. Um, so anyway, you can adjust your uh, travel plans for August if you were planning on going to the APTA conference. Uh, next regular board meeting is scheduled for June the 4th at 3 p.m. And I believe with the governor's phases, uh, almost certainty that we will be doing one of these Zoom meetings again. Uh, so plan on a Zoom meeting for June the 4th. And I wanna thank staff for getting this Zoom meeting set up um, and also providing the availability for this for our uh, committee meetings here over the next uh, couple of months. So appreciate staff's work on IT there. I really like this Zoom setup. Um, actually, so we can see everybody. So thank you, uh, Emmett, to you and your team. Um, 
and we'll go then to the Chief Executive Officer's report. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of quick things. Um, first, on the federal legislative front, just to confirm that we've completed a round of thank yous to our congressional electeds and to their staff um, and maintain direct lines of communication, uh, continuing communication with the electeds and the staff. We're hopeful for a second round of CARES II stimulus funding. And uh, I wanna stay close with our congressional delegation advocating for continued support for public transportation. Uh, li likewise, lines of communication and thank you letters with the acting administrator of the Federal Transit Administration I believe I mentioned a month ago that she had reached out personally for conversation and invited us to maintain a direct line of communication with her. Uh, and she has been a very active advocate uh, on behalf of uh, public transportation. Her boss, the Secretary of Transportation, Federal Secretary of Transportation, um, did a nice uh, video thank you specific to public transportation recently, and it was nice to receive that from Secretary of Transportation. Um, locally, um, State Representative Jared Mead was appointed to fill a vacancy on the Snohomish County Council, as you know. Uh, you may not know that Representative Mead was uh, assigned to, uh, as an alternate to our Community Transit Board of Directors. Um, we had previously met with, <clears throat> with uh, Council Member Mead when he was a state representative and I got off to a good start uh, in a relationship uh, my understanding from conversation with uh, Council Member Wright that uh, Council Member Mead was very enthusiastic about having a role in public transportation and joining our board as an alternate. One last thing I want to let you know regarding uh, Everett Transit and uh, Ever the city of Everett and Everett Transit, they are continuing their evaluation of um, how to approach Everett Transit going forward. Um, I've told you before, they're evaluating three alternatives. One is a status quo alternative, which is uh, by uh, all analysis and, and unsustainable, uh, uh, an alternative that is financially unsustainable over the long term. Uh, they're evaluating an alternative of inclusive, increasing their own tax rate from six tenths of 1% sales tax to nine tenths and uh, evaluating how they would be able to operate transit with with an increase in their own revenue. The third alternative is uh, to evaluate unifying their system with community transit. That would essentially be an annexation or a merger, if you will. Uh, that uh, All that work is underway. They have hired a third party consultant to assist them. We have hired a consultant to assist us. Uh, expect that evaluation to be ongoing through second quarter and third quarter, and the city plans to make a recommendation to the city council towards the end of this year. And that's all I have to report, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we'll go then to board communication and begin with council member Daughtry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The only thing I had to report is like all the rest of you, our uh, summer festival, Aquafest has been canceled for the year. It was a really tough decision, but really didn't have much we could uh, change on that decision. It was, how are you gonna, how are you gonna pull off one of those things where you're gonna have 15,000 people elbow to elbow on Main Street? It's kind of hard to do. Um, other than that, uh, in our Memorial Day service that we generally have down at our War Memorial will be still happening. Uh, we're trying to figure out how to do that uh, and still meet the guidelines. And the reason we're still going to do that is we had uh, promised the uh, city uh, that we would have the new war memorial dedicated on Memorial Day. So we are trying our best to make that happen. If it does, I'll let everybody know that we're going to do it and tell you how. It seems like we're going to try to do something with the radio station so that anybody can hear it on the radio and also live stream it and maintain our social distancing. As you can see, I'm behind Pluto right now on the uh, Starship Enterprise, maintaining social distancing myself. Well, thank you. I was wondering where you were at, your <laughs> lunar module there. Um, Mayor Kelly. Um, I like this. If I was there, I would have been munching on grapes. Here I, here I munched on pizza rolls, and that's why I turned my video off. That's all I got. <laughs> Nice reminder of the grapes. I haven't had good community transit grapes in a while. 
I was wondering if you were suffering there. So yeah. yeah, I'll tell you when we have our first live meeting, I hope we have giant bowls full to make up for it. Thank you, Mayor Kelly. Uh, Councilmember Merrill. Um, nothing really for me to report today. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Nearing. Nothing much to add here. Just want to say I really appreciate MS leadership and all the staff at CT for uh, all their work during this difficult time. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Labor Representative Norton. <clears throat> Here, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, finally. I've been on since the beginning, but I don't know what was going on. Anyhow, um, I thank all the uh, uh, reports and uh, all the people working to strive hard to get through this difficult period. I, th I have nothing else. Thank you. Thank you for that. Council Member Shwetty. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, what I'd like to say is, you know, we're in extremely difficult times now, something that we've never had to face before. And I can't tell you how much I have admired and appreciated the staff at Community Transit and what they have done uh, to keep people moving and getting to their jobs and grocery stores and doctor's offices. And I especially want to thank our coach operators and our mechanics who are there every day um, and having to face uh, a going out into the public and increased dangers. So I really, really uh, want them to know that what they're doing is not going unnoticed and we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor uh, Smith. Yes, thank you. Uh, I appreciate all the other board comments uh, with regard to the excellent work that uh, Community Transit's doing under Emmett's leadership. Uh, and other than that, I have no other comment. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Todd. Yeah, thank you. Ditto others' comments about the agency. I'm proud of what Community Transit's doing. I do have a report on behalf of the agency, the Transportation Policy Board, where I represent the organization the meeting was canceled in April and will also be canceled in May but in the interim the pub the Puget Sound uh, Regional uh, Puget Sound Regional Council uh, TPB staff is continuing to work with our staff at Community Transit and with the city staffs on grant proposals for the regional FTA FHWA grant competition that's going on right now so that work is still going on uh, it's not being delayed by any of this uh, but we will get to a point where we'll have to have a meeting to talk about it the other meeting I attend on behalf of cities, but it's relevant, is that the April executive board meeting down at PSRC, as Jerry noted earlier, did approve their, the um, 50, $531 million for the region, $39 million for community transit and the FTA CARES funding. Um, what was interesting during the discussion is it was really evidence to me that many people on that board don't fully understand how FTA funding is apportioned out in this region. It's done by formula based on service, the type of service, the hours of service, but the issue was raised about fairness and equity and it will be an ongoing discussion. So each of you, if you hear this, be aware that it is a fair formula. Uh, Community Transit got an amount of money that is commensurate with the amount of service that we provide, um, but it may come up again in terms of revisiting that formula over the next few months. I imagine it'll come back to the Transportation Policy Board and we will look to uh, community transit staff for support in that discussion to make sure we continue to get our fair share. If our citizens are paying the highest sales tax rate for bus service, we ought to make sure nobody takes our money. So we will look out for that carefully. Thank you, end of my report. Thank you. Council member uh, Wright. Council member Wright. Not sure if uh, maybe she might not have been able to make it on. I know she was going to be late. Um, and then back to uh, our uh, Emmett. You oh, had a, sorry. Uh, oh, go ahead, Council Member Wright. Sorry, I don't have any report. I just didn't get myself unmuted quick enough. Sorry. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. And back to our CEO, Emmett. You had a final comment, I think. I did. Let me check. Did Mayor Smith get an opportunity in that round? 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, I just wanted to say to you all um, that we very much appreciate the support of the board, your individual comments of support and appreciation. What I want you to know is that I will be sure to personally pass those on to 850 of my colleagues at Community Transit who are doing that work every day. Um, had, uh, had some really nice written notes of appreciation from some board members, one in particular from Council Member Merrill struck me, um, but we've had others and uh, we share those internally and people love knowing that you're paying attention to what we're doing and that we have your support. Uh, helps us uh, do our job every day. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a rewarding uh, relationship that our agency has with this board. Thank you. Thank you. That's much appreciated. Um, and we do not have need uh, of an executive session, correct? Correct. So is there any other business related to the corporation? If not, could we get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Mayor Kelly and Mayor Smith seconds. All in favor? Aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Any opposed? Thanks again for everybody's flexibility. Thank you to staff and uh, have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank and happy you. Mother's Day to all the mothers. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank happy you. Mother's Day. <laughs>